All right. Welcome to class for uh, Monday, March 30th. Um, today we're talking about uh, energy. We're talking about uh, changing energy from one type to another. Uh, so that's going to be our, that's going to be the topic. Um, reminders, there are two pages of reminders today. Um, so we're still working out or trying to work out a schedule. The only thing that in this class that has a hard due date at this point is the reading, the perusal reading. Um, the perusal reading, uh, the next one is due on Friday. Um, that'll allow us to keep moving forward at the right pace in order to get through what we need to get through this semester. Um, so, you know, previously they were basically once a week, they were due every Monday. Um, now they're going to be due at other times. Um, so I'll try to do my best to keep updating this because there's really, there's really three things that I need you to be keeping up on in terms of turning stuff in, uh, the perusal readings, and then I will post, um, sort of you should complete by this date information for the video experiments and the Wiley Plus. Um, but those are, uh, there, there are no immediate deadlines for those. I'll talk, to the, talk about that more in a minute. Um, but this week, you should complete and submit video experiments number one and two. There is not a video experiment number three yet. That'll be posted on Wednesday. Um, but we're, so most class periods, not all, but most class periods will have a new video experiment. Um, and this, for this week, you should uh, complete and submit video experiments number one and two, uh, which we posted last week. Um, the other thing for this week, you should complete the Wiley Plus homework for chapter seven and the homework and adaptive practice for chapter eight. Um, that's a lot, but we got to run. So uh, we'll do our best here. Um, for the video experiments, um, what I've decided to do is that they're going to be graded one week after they're submitted via the Google form. So you submit via the Google form, and then you've got a week to update, improve, ask questions on um, and then they're free to be graded. That just makes it so that people can submit things and that, uh, so I can look at them and you can ask me questions or Sean questions, um, in office hours, which we'll get to in a sec. Uh, but it also means that we can get the grading moving forward because if we don't start grading them all, then, uh, they're going to destroy Sean's life the last week of classes. Um, and you can submit the video experiment reports up to May 8th. That's technically the last Friday of classes before finals week. Um, okay, office hours. That's our second. We ha I had to have two reminder slides. Reminder is the wrong word anymore. Now these are announcements. Um, I've decided for my office hours, I'm just going to stay online on this on this zoom chat uh immediately after our class is done so when i say you know i'm turning off the recording class is done you know you're welcome to stick around and ask questions um i'll just stay around and answer questions until people are done or i have to leave for some other purpose um, but i'll plan on making that sort of a regular feature uh, Sean is going to do office hours Mondays and Thursdays from about 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, so we'll try the first one of those today. Um, is that correct, Sean? Well, we can't hear Sean, but I'm going to assume unless he like starts panic waving his hands. Nope, we got nothing. One, we good for eleven a.m. Um, there can you go. hear me now? Yes. 
Okay. So, yes, I believe we are still good from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Same Zoom link. Um, I'll be here. Ask me questions. Also, if you want to just say hi, I'm cool with that. Um, but, yeah, I'm here today, and I'm going to be here on Thursday from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Okay. So, 11 to 1, Mondays and Thursdays. Um, and... Um, just a couple of other quick, uh, quick comments. One is that um, I understand there's some frustration with the Wiley Plus. It's online homework. It's going to do all kinds of just stupid fiddly things like not accept your answer because you, you know, I don't know, you didn't perform the proper sacrifice of a goat before submitting it. Um, don't worry about that. W what, I still haven't figured out the grading on Wiley Plus either. So you're not alone if you can't operate the system very well. Um, but we'll make sure that that isn't a grade killer. That the goal is if you give it, if there's, if you give it a good effort, you try to answer those questions, you try to learn the physics, not the Wiley Plus interface, but the actual physics, we'll, we'll make sure that that counts, okay? Um, and the one other thing I wanted to comment on is the, um, the, uh, the video experiments. Um, again, the goal here is not to wipe you out. The goal is to try to find some way to give you some semblance of a lab experiment experience. Um, the best we can when none of us can be in the same room. So. Uh, we'll just do our best with those. Okay, um, moving on to actual physics. Uh, here is your, uh, I guess they're not clickers anymore. We'll call it a polling question for today. Um, so you've got a spring. The left end of the spring is attached to a wall. When Bob pulls on the right end with 100 newtons of force, he stretches the spring by 20 centimeters. The same spring is then used for a tug of war between Bob and Alice. Each pulls on their end with a force of 100 newtons. How far does the spring stretch? And I'm gonna launch the poll. Okay, I'll give you another 10 seconds. Going once, twice. It's old. Okay, so we had uh, amazingly consistent results. Um, almost, we had the same number of votes for all four options, um, which is, probably not what we wanted. Uh, the, the answer here is 20 centimeters, and here's why. This is a trick question. This isn't even a, an energy question. This is a Newton's third law question, right? So the, the trick here is that the wall is exactly the same as a person for the context of generating a force, right? If you have 100 Newtons of force acting on the wall, right? And the wall isn't moving, then the wall has to be acting on 
the, the spring with 100 newtons of force. So if you change out the wall for a person, it actually doesn't change anything. Okay, this is, so th this is a trick question that physics professors love to give because what it gets at is the idea that sometimes we conflate forces with actions by something, right? A person or a motor or something. Forces don't have to come from some like animate object. Forces come all the time in the physics sense of the word from walls and floors and all sorts of things. And so in this case, the wall is absolutely no different than the person, right? Than Bob or Alice. And so the string, will, the spring will stretch exactly the same way. Um, okay, here's an actual question about uh, potential energy. So every kid on a swing knows that if you pump your legs properly, you will swing higher and higher with each swing back and forth. What does this mean for the kinetic and plus gravitational potential energy of the kid swinging? I'm gonna relaunch the pole. Maybe. Come on, pole. There we go. Can you see the pole? Yeah. All right. Okay, I'll give you another 20 seconds. All right, going once, twice, sold. All right, all, all of you, everyone who answered that question got it right, so good job. It's increasing. Um, so how does that work? Where is the energy coming from? Right? Because you have this kid and when he swings back and forth, right? Swings back and forth. What you're getting, if it, if it's just a, if it wasn't a kid, right? If it was a rock swinging back and forth, you just swing back and forth to the same height each time. If we ignore friction and air resistance and all that. And so basically all that's happening is up here, you've got a lot of potential energy. And then down in the middle, you've got a lot of kinetic energy. And then up here again, you've got a lot of potential on the other side, right? So that would be a case of if you added the kinetic and the gravitational potential energy, you would get a constant. So obviously if you're swinging higher each time, the, the total, the mechanical energy, the kinetic plus potential energy of the kid is increasing. So the funny thing is, where is that energy coming from? Because you all know that if you want to change energy, you have to do work, right? So where on earth is that kid? What's doing work on the kid? Maybe is the question, right? And it turns out the answer is that the, the, what's doing work on the kid is the kid himself. The kid by pumping his legs, by leaning, changing where his body is centered, leaning forward and back at the right times, is able to do work on the swing, okay? So where does that energy come from? Well, that energy comes from chemical potential energy because the kid ate food and the kid's food got turned into something that his muscles could use and his muscles could use that to turn into a force and blah, 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 we go down the road. Okay, so in this case, this is an example of how energy is useful, but it's also a tricky thing to work with because energy is sneaky. Energy can hide in a lot of places. It can seemingly, it, it can come into a system. It can go out of a system, right? So 
when we talk about conservation of energy, conservation of energy is something we have to be very careful with because energy is only conserved mechanically if the only forces acting on an object are conservative forces. And it turns out that a kid, a kid's muscles are not conservative forces, right? Friction's not a conservative force. Um, a lot of other forces, tension is not a conservative force. Contact forces are generally not conservative forces. So we have to be careful with these things. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about conservative forces. Uh, no, that's not what I wanna do. I'm doing the wrong thing, here we go. Okay, so let me, uh, no, that's not the thing I wanted to do either. I want to do this thing. All right. So let's talk a little bit, a little bit more about potential and, and uh, kinetic energy. So if you remember, when we talked about conservation of energy, we started from the work kinetic energy theorem, and we showed that if our force was a potential, right, a, a potential energy, or if our force was conservative, so if our force is conservative, if all the forces are conservative, right, then we can simply write conservation of energy, we can rearrange that work kinetic energy to simply be the kinetic energy plus the potential energy at some time is equal to the kinetic energy plus the potential energy at some future time. Now, there are a couple of times that this is useful. Kinetic and potential energies are useful because we don't have to worry about what goes on in the middle. Like, let's think about the kid on the swing, right? Here's our kid on the swing at the highest point. Here's our kid on the swing at his lowest point. We don't actually have to worry about what goes on between these two points. We don't have to worry about how much time it took to go from here to here, right? We technically don't even have to worry as long as the only forces acting here the only forces doing work are conservative forces, right? We don't even have to care about how it got from here to here. Now, we do have to be a little careful here. So if I draw a free body diagram of this object, right, over here, what does it look like? Well, we've got gravity going down, right? Gravity is a conservative force, wonderful. But we also have here a tension force, right? In the string or the chain that the swing's on. That tension force is not a conservative force because in this class, there are only two conservative forces. There's gravity and there's springs, and this is neither. So that would, that would kind of indicate that, well, maybe we can't use conservation of energy here, but I just said we could. Well, here's the trick. Which way is the sprint is the kid moving? Well, the kid is always moving tangent to let's use a different color here. The kid's velocity is always tangent to the circle, right? The kid is always moving perpendicular to the radius or the tension force which means that if we write out the work done by tension, right, it's just the integral of my tension force dotted into my change in position. But the interesting thing here is because these are perpendicular, right, because the tension force is always perpendicular to the direction of motion, this dot product is zero meaning the tension force does no work, okay? So because the tension force, the tension force is here, but the tension force does no work, 
this we can still use conservation of energy. We can still write this thing as the initial kinetic plus the initial potential due to gravity is just equal to the final kinetic energy plus the final potential energy again due to gravity. So if we, the, but the important thing to remember here is there is another force. That tension force is there. It just doesn't do any work. So we're fine. But we better be sure it's not doing any work before we get too far ahead of ourselves. So what that means here is if we wanted to write the potential and kinetic energy for that kid on the swing, right? Well, the first thing we got to do is we got to pick a zero of, of potential energy. And I'm going to pick this. I'm going to pick the lowest point to be a zero. I could pick the highest point. I could pick any other point. But I'm going to pick the lowest one because that's going to make life a little easier. At its highest point, the kinetic energy is zero, right? And the potential energy at that point is just the mass of the kid times 9.8 times however high the kid goes, right? Where that's our H. Okay, now let's come over here. So there's our initial. Now let's think about our final. Well, that's just one half mv squared for our, kinetic, our final kinetic energy. And I already said that our potential energy is zero. So now what we've got is a statement that says, if we plug all these in, our initial potential energy is equal to our final kinetic energy. So we can figure out how fast the kid's going simply by knowing how fast the kid's going down here simply by knowing how high the kid went up there. Now here's the great part. We can do it the other way too. If we know how fast the kid's going here, we know how high he's going to go. And we don't have to do this just at one point. We could say, okay, I want to know. So here's my highest point, right? Here's my lowest point. I want to know what happens in between these two along this path. Okay. Well, I can do that. All I have to do is write out. I know my initial kinetic and potential energies haven't changed. My finals are going to be different because now I'm going to want to pick some other spots, right? And so my kinetic energy at that other spot, I'm going to call it uh, middle, right, is still just one half mv squared. And my u middle is just mg. And then the position at the middle, right? And I can plug these back in and I can get mgh is just one half mv squared plus mgy of the middle. So now I can, now if I give you a height in between that highest point and that lowest point, right? You can tell me how fast it's going. You didn't need to do that you didn't need to do anything fancy here right you can just use conservation of energy to happily work through however whatever setup you want right whatever point you want there's nothing special about the bottom okay this leads me to one other point that i need to make about uh about potential energy and that is that when we talk about potential energy let's imagine I've got a car and it's going to go over a hill like that. So here's my car, right? And it's going to go over this hill. Okay. If I were to ask when the car's right here, what does its free body diagram look like? Well, you'd have a, you'd have its weight going down, right? Weight due to gravity. And you'd have a normal force going that way. And you'd also have, and I'll do it in a different color because it's not, it doesn't go on the free body diagram, right? So I'm going to put it over here. 
you'd also have some velocity that way, right? But as long as we're only ever moving along the surface, this normal force and this velocity are always perpendicular to each other, which means that that normal force, the work done by that normal force, right, which is just the integral of the normal force dotted into the displacement, is always zero. As long as the car is only moving along the surface, okay? This changes if the car jumps off the surface or sinks into the surface, right? Or the surface moves upwards, right? But as long as the car just moves along the surface, it will do no work which means we don't have to worry about it, okay? So normal forces and tension forces in this class generally are what we call, so can be, I shouldn't say generally are, can be constraint forces. Let me write that. Constraint forces do no work. Constraint forces are simply forces that act perpendicular to the direction of motion. They're forces that make you move in a specific path rather than ones that speed you up or slow you down. So if we wanted to ask how fast the car was going, if it just coasted along these hills, right? All we'd have to know is its potential energy and its kinetic energy at one point and then if you tell me where it is i can tell you how much kinetic energy it has how much potential energy it has okay so let's do an example of this right let's dream up some nasty convoluted example that shows us why energy might be useful so here's my nasty convoluted example so you've got a block with a mass of four kilograms right there, the block mass of four kilograms, and it's going to be launched by a compressed spring. The spring is compressed 10 centimeters or 0.1 meters. So then the block slides down the ramp, this curved ramp gets to the bottom and then starts sliding up this straight ramp. Okay. It's a, and they're, we're going to assume they're frictionless, okay? When the block has traveled a distance of one meter up the ramp, it has a speed of eight meters per second. And I want you to calculate the spring constant. So I'm going to give you just a minute to think about this. And remember, this is an energy problem. So we need to think about two points, right? We need to think about how much energy it has at the beginning and how much energy it has over here at the end. We don't need to worry about what's going on in the middle. We can just think energy at the beginning is going to be equal to energy at the end because all of the other forces here are constraint forces, right? They're normal forces that just keep this thing moving along a predetermined path. So we don't have to worry about the work they do. So I want you guys to think about it for a minute, grab a piece of paper and, and uh, take a minute and think about what kind of energy we've got up here, what kind of energy we have over here, okay? So I'll give you just a moment to do that.
Okay, hopefully everybody's had a moment to think about that. And like I said, I really encourage you to uh, to watch this with um, some, you know, paper and a pencil so you can sketch this down because this will this will help a lot better if you actually do something rather than just listen to me talk about something. Um, okay, so uh, go, go ahead and chime in on this one. What kind of energy do we have to worry about up here at the top of the ramp? Wouldn't it just be a, wait, is this one that I should come in? Not you, Sean. Okay. Gravity. It should be gravity. gravity. Yeah. So we've got a gravitational potential energy, right? Which means we're going to have to think about how high the block is from some zero point, right? And a natural zero point would be the bottom of the, the diagram, right? But it doesn't have to be. We could pick the zero to be up at the top. But yes, we've got gravitational potential energy. Okay, what else? For what part of the, for what part of the diagram? So yeah. let's, let's see, I think I turned off my thing. I'm talking about up here, up at the top, right? The initial, energy right we've got gravitational potential we're gonna to have to worry about what else uh spring right we compressed a spring so we're gonna to have to worry about some spring potential energy okay anything else up here correct answer no it's not moving yet right so it will be right? It will be launched by a compressed spring, but before it's launched, it's not moving. Okay, now let's come down here, right? It's, it's, it's been launched, it's slid down this curve part, it's been sliding up this ramp, and now it's gotten to this point. What kind of energy do we have to worry about over here? Gravity. Gravity again, yep, we've got gravitational potential energy over here. What else? Kinetic energy. Yes, we've got kinetic energy over here. And we don't have spring potential energy anymore, right? Because we're wouldn't assume... kinetic energy. I'm sorry, what was wouldn't that? Kinetic, wouldn't kinetic energy at that last point be zero? Ah, no, because at that point, it's got a speed of eight meters per second up here. So, ah, so it right? didn't stop. Okay. So it's not stopped up here. Yeah, it's not stopped up here. Um, that's a good point. So, so if we work this problem, let me come over here and um, we'll set this thing up. Okay, if we work this problem, we're basically saying here's our here's our setup, right? We've got a we've got a block up here. We've got a spring right? And then the block is going to be over here, okay? And, and here's our level, okay? And we know that the block has a mass of four kilograms, right? The spring, I'm going to call that delta L, right? The change in length of the spring from its equilibrium is 0.1 meters, okay? And I know that the height, right, of the ramp from here to here is one meter. I know this angle right here is 30 degrees. And I know that this block has traveled up the ramp a distance D, which is also one meter. Okay, so. We said that up here, here's our initial point, right? Here's initial. And here is our final point, okay? Now this is just an accounting problem, right? We have to figure out how much you had initially, how much you're gonna have final. So initially, we had no kinetic energy, 
we did have some gravitational potential energy and we did have some spring potential energy. Okay, now the gravitational potential energy requires that we pick a zero somewhere. So there are three places in this problem where it would seem logical to pick a zero, right? You could pick a zero up here where the block started. You could pick it down here, or you could pick it where it ended, okay? I'll give you a hint that will generally make things easier. It's generally easier to pick a zero in your potential energy at either the initial or final location. And here's why. If I pick the zero to be here at the floor, now I have gravitational potential energy here and here. Whereas if I pick it to be up here, now I don't have any here, I do have some there. And if I pick it here, I don't have any at the end, but I do have some at the beginning. So let's make our lives easy and let's just pick it to be zero at the initial location. So here is our potential energy equals zero. I'm writing kind of small, I gotta write bigger. Okay, so initially that means all we had is spring potential energy, which is just one half K, the change in length of the spring squared. Okay, that's all our initial stuff. Right, so let's put this over here. This is initial. Okay, now we've got to think about final. Okay, we do have kinetic energy, right? We've got one half mv squared. Oh, I didn't write down how much v was. V is eight meters per second, okay? I do have a different gravitational potential energy, but now let's be careful. This, this block is lower here than it is up here. And I know that because this is one meter, this is one meter, but this is only a 30 degree angle, which means this leg of the triangle, the height of that block can't be, can't be a meter, right? So I've got some gravitational potential energy and it's gonna look like mg, and then it's going to look like the difference between here and here. So now we got to figure out what that is, right? Well, we know the difference from here to here is H. And we know we can figure out this side of the triangle by using a little trig. So this side of the triangle is just going to be D cosine theta. Uh, sorry, sine, should be sine. Let's try that again. This is gonna be D sine theta because it's the opposite side of the triangle to our angle. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So this side is D sine theta, which means this distance here is D sine theta minus H, okay? And finally, we have no spring potential energy over here. So now it's just set initial equal to final. So what we're gonna do here is we're going to say our initial energy is only that spring energy, one half K delta L squared. Our final has kinetic plus Potential energy. Dr. Nelson? Yes? Wouldn't it be like, wouldn't it be the bigger side minus the smaller side? Ah, no. You're talking about why this is, why this value, let me use a different color. Why this value is the small piece minus the big piece. Here's why. We want this to be a negative number because it's below our zero, right? <laughs> So we're interested in this distance, but we want it to be negative. So you want that length to be negative, that, that D sine, the little? The D sine theta isn't a negative number, right? And this isn't a negative number, the H. But the number we put in for our potential energy needs to be negative because it's below our zero, 
right? So our potential so you... energy goes up as we move upwards. So if we're zero here, we've got to be less than zero down there. If you were to subtract uh, the small from the big, all you have to remember is to throw in the negative, right? Right. So, so uh, what you're saying here is that this is equivalent. Um, let's just come down here. This is equivalent to saying it's negative MGH minus the sine theta. Yeah, the big height minus the small height. Yes. Mm -hmm. Does that make more sense? Uh, yeah, in my mind it does, but I don't know okay. if it might help others. Well, that's fine. I, I mean, mathematically, you can see these are the same thing, right? I just, yeah. we just distribute the negative. that negative in and it switches the negative and the positive. Whichever one makes more sense to you is just fine, right? But the key point here is it's got to be a negative pot gravitational potential energy because we put our zero up here. So if we go below that point, our gravitational potential has to be negative. Okay, so if we finish writing this thing out, right? And we could do the exact same thing if we put the negative in here, right? It would just be negative there and we would have flipped these two around. But now we can recognize something. We know everything in this problem except for K. We know the distance the spring was stretched. We know the mass. We know how fast it's going. We know the distance and the height, the initial height. We know the angle. So we're good to go here. So if we solve this thing for K, we're gonna get that K is this whole, so we gotta multiply by two and divide by L squared for everything up here. So it's gonna look like MV squared plus two MG D sine theta minus H all over delta L squared. Okay, and if we plug in some numbers, we're gonna get some, uh, we're gonna get, uh, we can actually get the, the number out of this thing, right? So um, a couple of hints, what's the sine of 30 degrees? Anybody remember that? Well, luckily for us, Google does. So if you go to Google, and type in the sine of 30 degrees. Be sure to add the degrees, otherwise it'll think you're putting the angle in in radians like a decent person would. The sine of 30 degrees is a half, right? So what that means is when we put in numbers, right? M is four, V is eight. So eight squared is 64 plus two times four I'm gonna make G 10, right? It's really 9.8, but I'm gonna make it 10 because that'll make my life easier. And we'll get an approximate number. It won't be exactly right. D is one, sine theta is a half. So this is a half minus one all over delta L is 0.1. So this is 0.01 on the bottom, right? We'll keep working the math here. I don't know what four times 64 is, but we can pull the four out of both of these terms, right? So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna write this as 400, right? Cause that's four divided by this guy. So I've taken care of the fours and the hundred times 64. Now this is gonna be a minus a half. It's gonna cancel that too. So I'm just gonna end up with minus 10, right? And that comes out to 400 times 54, right? And you can figure out what that is. 400 times 54 is going to be like uh, 20,000? 20, 21,600. Great. 21,600 newtons per meter. So it turns out this spring was pretty beefy, right? But this actually isn't bad. This is, this is not, uh, you have a bigger spring in your garage door um, or a, a, a spring with a bigger spring constant than that in your garage door. Um, but it's not the kind of spring you'd want to get your finger caught in. 
So let's review this real quick. The key here, right, once we got to this step, from here it's just algebra, right? And you guys can do algebra. The hard part of this problem is this step, right? Getting your initial energies and your final energies and then setting them equal, right? So recognizing how much of the different types of energy you have, right, at the two locations you picked, the initial and the final, okay? And then figuring out how to express them in terms of the things that you were given in the problem. That's the hard part of these problems. It's figuring out how to express these things, how to, how to identify these energies, and then express them in terms of the things that you already know. Okay, a couple of, of hints with that. Drawing a picture is good. I made the mistake of drawing this picture too small. I should have drawn this picture much bigger because the picture helps you organize your thoughts, okay? The other thing we had to be careful of here is we had to pick a zero of potential energy. Now here's the interesting thing. Let's suppose we had put the zero down here, right? We would have had some potential energy over here and we would have had some potential energy on the final side, right? All that would have done is taken this negative MGH term and moved it over here and made it a positive MGH term, which is algebraically exactly the same as what we did. This is why you can pick your zero of potential energy to be anywhere, anywhere you want. Because mathematically, all you're doing is adding or subtracting something from both sides of the equation, as long as you are consistent. Let me stress that. You have to be consistent. You get to pick your zero once, but you only get to pick it once. You can pick it zero, to be zero anywhere you want, but you can only pick it to be zero in one place. So be careful with that. We could have just as easily picked zero up here, right? And then we would have ended up with a positive of this term over on the initial side, okay? All right, questions about this? We feeling good? All right, I got a thumbs up or two. We'll take that. Okay. Um, let me come back over here um, and by the way, I did want to remind people, I do have these slides available on Blackboard. Um, you can, uh, there's a link uh, on Blackboard that takes you to a directory full of these things. They're a little tricky to navigate, but we're basically going in numerical order. So today is class 25. Okay, so let's see if this works. I don't know if this will stream well, but this is a lovely little clip from the Simpsons of Homer Simpson going around a, a spherical cage on a motorcycle. And he's heroic because he's Homer Simpson. Um, okay, so this is, a, this is a, a fun little problem. And here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna figure this out in terms of energy, okay? So if we think about Homer Simpson, he's riding his motorcycle around the cage and we're gonna consider when he did a vertical loop, right? Meaning he did a loop that went through the bottom of the cage all the way up to the top, okay? His velocity at the bottom of the loop is 30 meters per second, and the cage has a radius of 700 meters. Homer and the bike have a mass of 300 kilograms. After getting to that speed, 30 meters per second at the bottom of the loop, he coasts around the loop one more time. If we ignore friction and drag forces, 
I want to come up with functions for his kinetic and gravitational potential energy as he goes around the loop as functions of angle between zero radians at the bottom of the loop and two pi radians all the way around again at the bottom of the loop. Okay. So this gets at that concept that we had talked about a minute ago, where we don't necessarily have to just choose a fixed point to be our final. We can choose any location to be our final that we want to know. And what that'll do is that'll give us functions that show his kinetic and his potential energy as he goes around the loop, okay? So let's come over to this document camera and we'll draw this thing out. All right, so here's our loop, okay? And here's Homer Simpson. Uh, I don't know how to draw Homer Simpson on a bike. Yeah, that's Homer Simpson on a bike. It's beautiful. Okay, Homer Simpson is on the bike and we're going to define an angle theta that tells you how far Homer has gone around the circle, right? We know at the bottom, which I'm going to call our initial point, he's going 30 meters per second. Which remember, roughly speaking, a meter per second is about two miles per hour. So that means he's going quite fast. He's going 60 miles per hour. And that the radius of, the, of this cage that he's in is seven meters, okay? And that Homer and the bike have a mass of 300 kilograms. Okay, we're gonna ignore drag. We're gonna ignore friction. We do have a normal force here, right? If we drew the free body diagram for Homer, he's definitely got a normal force. But the normal force is a constraint force. It's always, because Homer's always moving along the surface, the, the normal force never does any work. So we don't have to worry about it in our energy budget. Okay, so we do have to worry about his, his gravitational potential energy and his kinetic energy. So initially, right, he's got some kinetic energy, which is just going to be one half m v i squared. And now we have to think about his gravitational potential energy. So it turns out we can put his gravitational potential energy a number of places here, the zero, we can put it a number of places. But I'm gonna make something that may look like a foolish choice, but it'll work out later. I'm gonna put his zero of potential energy right through the middle of the circle. I'm gonna call that our potential energy equals zero. And I'll show you why that works here in a minute, okay? So that means initially his gravitational potential energy is negative, right? Because he's below the center of the circle. So it's just gonna be negative mg times the radius, right? Okay, now we have our final location, but final isn't quite the right word. I'm still gonna write final here, right? But our final is just when he's at any angle theta, right? So he's got some kinetic energy, which is just gonna be one half m v squared, okay? He's gonna also have some potential energy there. But now we have to come up with an expression that tells us how far it is from this line to wherever he is in terms of this angle? Well, we can do that fairly easily as it turns out because we can draw a lovely triangle for any of these, right? We can draw a triangle that breaks down the angle. 
right? So here, when the angle was zero, we need that height. So let's make a little table here to organize this. Here's our angle. And here's what we need to put in for the height. When the angle was zero, we already figured that out. Our height was negative r, okay? How about when the angle is pi over two? That's 90 degrees. What's our height gonna need to be? Well, here's that angle. Our height mm -hmm. needs to be zero. Okay, let's keep going around. When our angle is straight up, right? When our angle is pi radians, our height better be r, positive r. Okay, so we need a function that will, and then let's keep going, right? When it's three pi over two, we need this to be zero again. And when it's two pi, we need it to be negative r. So we need a function that starts down low, gets to zero, gets bigger as you go up with angle, and then gets smaller, gets back to zero, gets back to negative. What kind of function would do that? What function gets bigger than it's a maximum at pi at straight up? and then get smaller as you go around. Well, let's draw the function, right? We, we figured this thing out a little bit. Let's come over here and plot this thing. Here's my angle, here's my height, okay? I wanna start off at negative r, right? There's negative r. And then I want something that's going to grow up to zero and then I want it to increase to a maximum, a positive R. And then I want it to come back down to zero and get back to a minimum. This one happens at pi over two. This one happens at pi. This one happens at three pi over two. And this one happens at two pi. Well, of course I just drew it, but what is that function? Either a sine or cosine. Yeah, know. sine and cosine do that. But the way I drew it is a little bit special, right? Sine starts at a positive number and goes down. I'm sorry, cosine starts at a positive number and goes down as you get bigger, right? Sine starts at zero and gets bigger as you go. So what we actually have here is just negative cosine, right? So H is just R, negative R times the cosine of my angle. So that means I can just put that in here for my u, right? I've just got mg times h, which is just negative mgr cosine of my angle. Okay, so now I've got it, right? I know everything over here. I know mass, I know G, I know R. So all I'm gonna have here is velocity and angle, which means if I put this all together and I give you an angle, you can tell me how fast Homer Simpson is riding around the circle. So let's get myself a fresh sheet of paper so I'm not trying to write small. Um, and we'll come over here and we'll just put this together. Our initial energy, is one half m v i squared minus m g r, and that's equal to our final energy, which is one half m v squared minus m g r cosine theta. Okay, this is just a constant, right? These are just numbers we're gonna plug in. All we have over here that we don't know is our velocity and our angle. Now, we can make life easier on ourselves if we recognize something real quick. One is that there's an M in every single term here, which means we can cancel the M's out. 
we don't have to worry about M, okay? So if we rearrange things a little bit, what we're gonna get here is, and let's move velocity alone on one side. Let's get velocity as a function of angle, okay? So let's move this to the other side. I'm gonna get one half V squared is equal to G R cosine theta plus one half V initial squared minus G R. Now I can combine these two terms as well, right? And I can rewrite this whole thing as G R cosine theta minus one plus one half vi squared. Okay, now I multiply by two and take the square root and I get that your velocity as you go around this circle is the square root of two gr cosine theta minus one plus VI squared. Okay, so this is a thing, right? We know we can put in numbers for this. We know that this is 30, that's 10 ish, that's uh, seven, right? But let's plot this thing because plotting it is going to be much more helpful to us maybe than just looking at this thing. So here's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to use Desmos because it's very, it's very convenient to use for, um, for an internet setup here. Um, if you haven't used Desmos before, uh, I would suggest playing around with it. It's a really nice way to make some graphs. Um, so you just go to desmos.com and you hit start calculating and it'll take you to this lovely page. And basically all this is is a graphing calculator for your computer, right? That's internet based. So we, we had figured out before that our velocity is equal to the square root which we can do like this to the one half power, right? Of two times 9.8, that's G, times seven meters times the cosine of theta. And if we type out theta, it's actually gonna make it for us. Close that parenthesis, minus one. Close that parenthesis. Oh, Nope, at the wrong thing. Close that parenthesis plus, and then we're gonna have that initial velocity squared plus 30 squared. And if we do that, we should be able to see something. Now, we don't actually see anything here. That's because we're zoomed too far out. There actually is something here. So we can control that by going up here we don't actually want to see this thing from negative 37 to positive 42. We want to see it from zero to two pi, which, oh, not zero, seven. Two pi is about 6.3, okay? And in our y-axis, we don't need to see it from negative 4.5 to 52, right? we can see it from ballparking this thing 25 to 30. And if we close this, we can see what that velocity is doing. It's weird. It's kind of a complicated thing, right? It's like this, it's the square root of a cosine function, but that's what the velocity is doing as he goes around the circle. Okay. Now here's the really cool thing about this. We didn't have to figure out what's happening around every point in the circle. We didn't have to figure out all of the normal forces. We got to ignore the normal force. 
which if you remember the bucket going around with the water in it, the normal force is the hard part there. We got to ignore that. We got to do this whole thing using only energy. All we had to worry about was the gravitational potential energy and the, velo and the kinetic energy, the velocity. Okay, there's one more thing I wanna show here. And that is, I want to show you what happens to the potential energy and the kinetic energy as you go around the circle, okay? So the kinetic energy, right, is just one half mv squared. m is 300, I gotta do times 300, times, but I know what v is, right? v is this whole mess. So I'm just gonna come up here, copy it, paste it, and get rid of the one half because it's squared, right? Uh, what did you like about that? Oh, it's yelling at me because, ah, no, don't do that. Okay, what did I do wrong? Oh, I see, I still left the superscript there. Okay, leave the superscript. All right, uh, we're gonna turn you off for a minute. Okay, and I'm gonna put my potential energy in, right? My potential energy we figured out was just negative mass, 300 grams, times G, 9.8, times cosine of theta, okay? Now, if we hit default zoom, it'll try to help us figure out how to zoom this thing. But as you can tell, it's gonna have a rough time. So the, the solution there is just zoom out until you can see, all, see both lines. Oh, I'm having trouble. Why can't I scroll? Okay, we're gonna have to help this thing. I still only wanna go from zero to two pi, right? So zero to two pi. We'll make it 6.5, okay? Now we can see there's still, we're still zoomed way too far in because in the Y direction, right? Dr. Nelson, you also haven't uh, multiplied your potential energy by seven. Oh, right. I missed a seven. Thank you. The radius, I forgot the radius. Okay. So we're still gonna have to zoom out a lot more, right? And this shouldn't be surprising that we should expect big numbers. Now this is where Desmos gets a little tedious and maybe is not the best tool. But we're just gonna keep going in here. We can zoom out in the Y and we can zoom in in the X. Ah, now we're starting to see something, right? So let's zoom out a little more. There's our potential energy, that's the green line. We should have a kinetic energy somewhere. Aha, there's our kinetic energy. So if we fix this one more time, I only wanna go from like negative one to like seven, okay? You can see what this is doing. The kinetic energy is big when you're at the bottom of the loop, which is exactly what you would expect. And it decreases as you move up the loop until you hit the top and then you start increasing out the other side. Okay, the potential energy is zero at the middle of the loop, which is exactly what we told it to do. It's negative at the bottom of the loop. It's positive at the top of the loop, and then it goes back down. And if we add these two things together, what's gonna happen? Let's do it. I'm just gonna say E equals K plus U. Voila, straight line. Because we told it to be a straight line, right? That's what we told it to do. We told it that energy was conserved. And so of course it has to be conserved. Okay, this, what we've just done here is we've plotted our energies as a function of position as they go around the circle, right? This has made it so that we can look at the change in the different types of energies. By the way, we shouldn't be surprised that kinetic energy was way up here and potential energy was way down here.
Kinetic energies always have to be positive, remember, because there's no such thing as imaginary velocities. And if you have a negative kinetic energy, that implies you have an imaginary velocity, or I guess you could have a negative mass. I don't know what either of those things mean. So when we talk about kinetic energies, they're always gonna be positive numbers. But potential energies could be positive or negative. It doesn't matter which one they are. Because if we make the potential energy positive, all that means is we put our zero further down. And if we make the potential energy negative, all that means is we put our zero further up. Okay, so uh, on Wednesday, you'll have a video experiment that is gonna ask you to graph these sorts of things using data, okay? So you'll have to do this using that Vernier graphical analysis package. But it's the same general idea. It'll want you to, it, you'll have velocity and you'll have position from the sensors on your cart. The data will give you those two. You'll have to figure out how to turn those into expressions for kinetic and potential energy. And then you'll have to plot those and show me that when you add them up, you get something that looks very close to a straight line. Now, if this is, okay, now let, let's take a step back here. If this is really Homer Simpson, okay, well, if this is really a real person, not Homer Simpson, who's really doing this and they're coasting around that circle, what's gonna happen to their total energy as they coast around the circle? It's not gonna stay constant because that energy is going to be lost to things like friction and drag. Those friction and drag forces are going to be opposite the direction of motion, which means they're going to do negative work, which means they're gonna take energy out of the system. So by looking at the total energy, we can actually gauge how important friction is to this particular setup right? By looking at how much energy we lose, we can get an estimate of how big a role friction plays or drag plays, okay? Okay, how are we feeling? Everybody pretty well fried for today? Yeah. All right, let me uh, get out of this thing and uh, come back over here. Okay, so key points for today. The key things we want to remember. We want to remember that when we talk about energy, we have to be careful that we're only dealing with conservative forces. Unless, and this is the big unless, unless those forces are constraint forces. Forces like tension or normal force, contact force, for an object moving perpendicular to those forces, right? So moving along a circle, being spun around, right? Was one example we did. Well, it was a swing, so it was this kind of a circle, right? Or in the case of the car or the block sliding along the weird shaped ramp, or, e or Homer Simpson going around the motorcycle cage, those forces were always perpendicular to the direction of motion, which means that when we talk about energy, we get to ignore them. This is hugely useful because those forces are very complicated. And so trying to figure this out in terms of Newton's second law is a mess because you have this force that this constraint force that gets in your way. But with energy, we can do these problems without even touching that, Be, just by realizing that it does absolutely no work. Now, I want to highlight one thing we can't do with energy. If you wanted to ask how long does it take Homer Simpson to coast around that circle, we couldn't do it here, at least not easily. 
And here's why. We don't have time in this. We don't know how long anything takes. All we know is how is distance, all we have here is distance and velocity. Now, it could be possible for us to relate those two quantities, but that's mathematically more intensive than we're gonna do in this class. So for now, what we're gonna do is use energy when we don't care about time. If we do care about time, then we're gonna have to go back and make uh, things messier. Okay, with that, I'm gonna, uh, well, I'm gonna ask, are there any questions? Anything anybody wants to ask about what we worked on today? All right, if we're feeling good, then I am going to shut down the recording and I'll stick around if people have questions about homework, uh, the video experiments, any of that stuff. Um, but we'll go ahead and, and call that a class. Thanks a bunch, guys.